This is the Bigger Pockets Podcast, show 495. So my question yeah. for everybody listening to this podcast is, okay, now that you've gone through the pandemic and you may still be going through it, you realize something about yourself and your ability to respond, to be flexible, to be resilient, and mm-hmm. to take risks when times are tough. Imagine what you could do if you took risks proactively towards the thing you want, just not when you're backed into a corner. You're listening to Bigger Pockets Radio, simplifying real estate for investors large and small. If you're here looking to learn about real estate investing without all the hype, you're in the right place. Stay tuned and be sure to join the millions of others who have benefited from BiggerPockets.com, your home for real estate investing online. What's going on, everyone? It's Brandon Turner, host of the Bigger Pockets podcast, here with my co host, Mr. David framework green what's up man how you doing i'm good i got my condos in hawaii finally getting worked on so we're upgrading those Fancy. puppies and i'll have my first air and b's up pretty shortly here air and b's is that a new thing did i say that <laughs> short-term <laughs> rentals that is what i meant to air say. and b's all right good 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 stuff man i got a good contractor uh i i've been working with the last few weeks who's pretty phenomenal so i'm gonna have to share him with you here because i'm just about done with him so I'll, oh there's i don't think there's a higher on. compliment in a friendship than sharing a contractor nope. I agree. <laughs> I mean, that's like I'd share my toothbrush before mm. I shared my contract. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, man, uh, we're talking today about a lot of good stuff, specifically uh, a real good look at risk, a good look at taking chances about possibility, uh, but a kind of a different twist on how we take risks with somebody who has been in the industry for a long time. Uh, not the real estate industry, though, the Silicon Valley industry. We're talking to a power player in Silicon Valley. Uh, her name is Sukinder Singh Cassidy. Uh, most recently, she was the president of StubHub, which is a huge, gigantic company. Uh, she's been on the board of a bunch of massive companies that you I know you've heard of. For example... J. Crew, Stitch Fix, TripAdvisor, Urban Outfitters. She worked at Google once. Like, there's a lot of huge stuff here in her portfolio uh, of businesses she's helped grow. And uh, she got a new book out, and you're going to hear more about that as well today. Uh, but it, we're going to talk a lot about risk. We're talking about leadership, about what makes a successful company grow and what makes them struggle. Uh, and yes, that applies if you have no employees or 100 employees. It's the same concept. We talk about frameworks a lot and how employees, especially, and people that you work with, contractors. I mean, like, I had a realization in this interview about working with contractors that I wish I would have had 10 years ago. It gave me a completely different way of dealing with them. And that going forward from this moment on, I'm going to have a very different way of dealing with contractors. I think you're going to love that. It's going to change your business as well. So that and more, make sure you listen for uh, that. And yeah, so much good stuff today. But we're going to talk about how to build your risk muscle. So that's kind of today's show. But before we get to the interview, let's get to today's quick tip. David, what you got for us? For those that have made it to the top of the mountain, or at least higher up the mountain than you were at one point, remember what it was like when you were at the bottom and you were full of vigor and desire Mm -hmm. to get up there and you just didn't know what to do or where to start and throw down a rope. There's so many people that are just going crazy inside trying to figure out what to do and we know what to do. And it's a little bit of effort that makes such a big difference in other people's lives. So oftentimes people won't say, we talk about that in the show, exactly what they're feeling, why they're intimidated, why they're afraid of risk, but they desperately want to start making some traction. So rather than always looking up and saying, where do I want to go? Sometimes it's okay to look down, see people behind you and give a hand and and pull them on up. Powerful stuff, man. Good job. Way to wing that at the last second. With that said, let's get today's show sponsors. All right. And I think that's pretty much ready to go. Anything you want to say before we bring in uh, Sukinder? No, I really like today's interview. Let's grab her and bring her in now. All right. Here we go. All right. Sukinder, welcome to the Bigger Pockets podcast. Awesome to have you here. Thanks, Brandon. Thanks, David. Yeah. So let, let's dive in. So you have been on, uh, I was reading your bio, you know, you, a, a ton of high profile boards, uh, ran successful companies, started companies. You've, you, you've been around the whole like Silicon Valley world for a long time. So there's about a million questions I could ask in terms of growth and leadership and all this stuff. But I want to start just by maybe getting a little bit of background on you. Like, how did you like get into this world where you're like this powerhouse in Silicon Valley? Like, how did that happen? 
Well, it's so funny you ask that. People always are like, oh, Sukinder, like what happened? How'd you end up in Silicon Valley? And you know, we all have this image, right? That everybody who's here must be some insider. But Mm -hmm. I grew up in a small town in St. Catharines, Ontario, and both my parents were doctors. But more than being doctors, my dad loved running a small business. Like when I say he loved being an entrepreneur, it's like it was amazing to sort of see him growing up. I only appreciate it now, of course. At the time, you're like, ah, dad, what are you having me do? But, you yep. know, he had us, believe it or not, like working on his taxes, like his ledgers by the time I was like seven or eight years old. Like preparing my dad's like books at the end of each year to file his taxes was like a family affair. And so, you know, I grew up with this very close in view of small business and of entrepreneurship and a father who loved it. And by the way, he didn't just love entrepreneurship and medicine, which was his day job. He also loved tech investing. Like who knew? Like I remember when my dad and my dad was older, right? So he was in his, he was in his, um, probably in his sixties or seventies. And I remember calling him up as his broker. Cause you remember, like it used to be that you read stock, stock prices in the newspaper, right? Mm -hmm. And he had this magnet, like magnifying glass because he couldn't read the numbers. They were so small and he'd call his broker and he'd be like, Tom, let's buy some AOL. I mean, I didn't even know what AOL was, but he was my 60 to seven year old dad. You know, he's probably 67, 68 at the time buying tech stocks in like 1990 something. So, so people always give me credit for being in the Valley, but I give credit to my dad because I feel like I went off yeah. to undergrad business school. I thought I wanted to be a big corporate executive. I ended up in investment banking. But by the time I was in my mid-20s, I was like, you know, I really want to be an entrepreneur. Like my dad told me to work for myself. And so if I did one thing right, it's probably that in my mid-20s, I quit my job and moved to Silicon Valley because I didn't know how to be an entrepreneur. But I figured there were lots of smart people to learn from. And turns out that was a pretty good time to quit. <laughs> yeah. and move somewhere. <laughs> yeah. So what what did you start? What was your very first business then? Uh, well, interestingly, my very, very first business was uh, a failed business. When I was sitting in London before I moved to Silicon Valley, I thought I would create cufflinks for women. I know, don't laugh, nah. but I was nah. like, I was like, you know what? Like I'm wearing all these suits and everything that's available for the guys because I was on a Wall Street banker. And uh, so I, I made a prototype and then I proceeded to do nothing with it. I didn't know how to market it. I didn't know how to set up a website. So fast forward, so that was a failed attempt. I carried those bag of coupling prototypes with me though, from house <laughs> to house, like literally through my 40s, just as a reminder. And then when I moved to Silicon Valley, I ended up at a startup that sold to Amazon. But um, I was at Amazon in my late 20s after the startup I was at sold, uh, sold to them. And many of the investors in a new company called Jungly, where the um, angel investors were the original founders of the company I was at. So they sold to Amazon, had a successful exit, became um, investors, and they introduced me to um, five engineers who were looking for a business co-founder. And my first company was Yodely. And for those of you who don't know what Yodely is, it was the very first platform for aggregating all your financial data. And it went 15 years before it went public and then was subsequently bought. So that was my first company in the Valley and um, all came through connections through Very the people cool. I'd worked for. Can I ask you a random question about Silicon Valley? Sure, please. Do you know what the first company was that ended, that added L-Y to the end of their name and started the trend <laughs> of tech companies that were something Lee, Yodely, Was it trendly? musically? Uh, oh, 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 wait, wait, you're thinking L-Y. Yodely was L-E-E, my friend. Same, same so thing. before they were the L-Y's, they yes. were the L-E-E. So you, keep yeah, in mind, yeah. I was at you Jungly. You had it before it was cool. I was you're at like Yodely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I am, I am the original hipster. Like, I'm wondering if you started the whole trend. Do we have the, the be. Oh, my God. It, yeah. well, it might have been us. I will just say, like, there's a whole co- set of companies started by Indian co-founders. Like I said, the company I worked at was called Jungly, and then my company was yes. totally. I mean, yeah, I think I think we did. Do we we get some credit, right? You should. I mean, that makes you like a legend, <laughs> right? You're like the first person to put cleats on a football field. Like, look there how much go. easier it is to run. For those that don't know, in the Bay Area, there's a trend for tech companies. They always do like something with their names. And right now it's to add Y to the end of a normal word. And that becomes <laughs> like whatever you're selling, right? You Bigger like pockets. CRM Lee. Lee. Yeah, we should. Yeah, that's yeah, exactly yeah. right. Bigger pockets. No, Real estate. <laughs> For whatever it's worth, I own a couple of domains that end with an L-Y. I don't know what to do yep. with them yet, but I did buy a couple myself. Oh, I think That's if you got funny. in on that real estate early, you just picked every word you could and added L-Y and bought the <laughs> domain, you probably made a killing. <laughs> uh, I love it. Uh, all right. All right. So, okay. So you, you, then you, you served on a lot of boards. You did a lot of that stuff. And now, uh, you know, here we are in 2021 recording this. And we just came through a hell of a year, to, to put it lightly, right? Like it, a lot of things changed during this year. And a lot of people, I mean, some people lost jobs. Some people realized maybe for the first time ever that their job wasn't so secure. So, so 
the first question I have on this is how did risk, like you, you talk about risk, you got a new book coming out. That's largely talking about risk. So what did the mm-hmm. pandemic do to our collective mindset when it comes to risk and comes to uh, security? Well, I think uh, I think you're hitting the whole reason I'm I'm here and I'm excited to chat with you guys. You're right. I do have a book coming out about how to take risk and how to take risk like systematically, right? How to kind of buck this idea that it's a one-off event that if you're lucky once, you'll succeed and, you know, embrace risk taking as a habit. So, how does the mm-hmm. pandemic fit in? Well, it's pretty interesting. I feel like in our daily lives, many of us hesitate to take risks, right? We worry about what will go wrong. We fear failure. We worry that somebody will laugh at us. We'll worry that we'll lose money. We'll worry that we'll be unhappy. I could risk, I could list like the three or four fears most people have when they try and make a decision and take a risk. And then all of a sudden the pandemic comes along and um, the pandemic is what I called a coconut event. Okay. So a coconut Hmm. event, according to researchers, is an event that happens that you simply can't predict. So there are events that can happen with some volatility that you can predict. Um, There are things called subway events. Like you can predict the subway is going to come and it's going to be either a couple minutes early or a couple of minutes late. So you can predict the range of volatility on a subway, right? And so you can plan for it. But what happens when a coconut happens? A coconut is like literally a coconut dropping out of a tree, hitting you on the head and you Mm -hmm. dying. That's like, that is the definition of a coconut event. So we all just had a coconut event. And it turns out the coconut events teach us a lot about our ability to take risk and to be resilient and take risk in the face of harm, right? So we always are like, oh my goodness, why is it so hard for people to take risk when things are good? Yet when things are bad, we find out really how agile we are and how responsive we are. So I think that's just what happened to all of us. Now, I'm not saying that the pandemic has been easy. In fact, it's been very difficult. But as you know, people all adapted and responded in ways they didn't think they were capable of, and they did it on a dime. So my question for everybody listening to this podcast is, okay, now that you've gone through the pandemic, and you may still be going through it, you realize something about yourself and your ability to respond, to be flexible, to be resilient, and Mm -hmm. to take risks when times are tough. Imagine what you could do if you took risks proactively towards the thing you want, just not when you're backed into a corner. So I think the pandemic taught us all about our ability to take risk. And it also taught us that even if you don't want to take risk, risk still happens to you. Mm -hmm. So isn't it better to kind of embrace it proactively and take advantage of it to its fullest? In your research, have you found that risk takers are generally just more like, is that, is that a sign of success? Like the more risks takey, the more risky you are, maybe that's the word, (laughs) adding a Y to it, right? The more risky you are, the more successful you become. Do they correlate? They do, but they don't correlate in ways people might expect. I think that we look at the world's biggest risk takers. Let's look at our friend, Richard Branson, who just went into space, right? Pretty amazing. I'm sure you guys agree, right? Yeah. Or you look at Elon Musk or you look at, you know, Jeff Bezos. And we often think, oh my goodness, Um, risk-taking is for the riskiest among us. Does that make sense? But what we fail Mm -hmm. to consider is that that's not Richard Branson's first risk. It's not his second risk. It's not his 100th risk. It's probably his 10,000th risk, right? Mm -hmm. Jeff Bezos, do you know how many attempts he took at Amazon Marketplace? I know. I was like the first company he bought to attempt Amazon Marketplace. 1997. No, 1999, Jeff Bezos, 1998, sorry, Jeff Bezos bought our company, Jungly. How long did it take for a marketplace to become successful? Jeff Bezos killed multiple versions of marketplace before it ultimately happened. So we tend to think that, you know, the most successful people in the world are risk takers. That's true. But they're not the kind of risk taker you imagine from the outside in, like one mighty choice that worked out. I'm like, they are risk takers because they built risk muscles. Does that make sense? And so I think that that's the opportunity for all of us. It's not to think of risk as this like mythical hero's journey where it's like one great choice that somebody made. And you look at that person, you go, oh my God. Rather, it's that they've been practicing risk taking with all its failures and successes, big and small for a long freaking time. Well, what about the way we define risk? I think when most people hear the word risk, it is automatically associated with bad. We see that a lot in our our world of real estate. When people hear HELOC or home equity line of credit, they immediately say, oh, that's bad, or subprime loan (laughs) equals morally evil because they were used unwisely for a time. Can you speak a little bit about maybe some of the misconceptions of risk that the uninitiated have versus those that have a bigger risk muscle? Yeah, sure. Absolutely. You're hitting it. So interestingly, if you looked at the dictionary, Merriam-Webster's definition of risk is 
I think it's danger or harm, the threat of danger or harm. Okay, so if you heard that word, who would want to take it? Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> that if you look at the definition of risk taking, it says it says something more along the lines of, you know, embracing uncertainty on the way to achieving a goal. Okay, mm-hmm. that's a more balanced way to think about risk taking. The reality is most of us think about taking risks. And by the way, when I say risk, it me- could mean a micro risk. You speak up in a meeting. It could be a medium sized risk, like, you know, you decide you're going to start a side hustle. It could be a gigantic risk, like you quit your job with nothing to go to, right? All three of those things are risks. But I think we tend to conceive of risk on the harm side of the equation. And I think that's one of the biggest misconceptions that risk equates with harm when most of the risks we have an opportunity to take are for upside. Yet we don't really talk about risk that way. But like, that's why the book is called Choose Possibility. It's trying to reframe risk for what it really is. Like every Mm -hmm. time we take a risk, we're kind of choosing a possibility, right? <laughs> it may or may not yeah. work out, but we are actively choosing a possibility and we're pursuing that possibility with every choice. And so I think that's one of the biggest mix- misconceptions. The other is the one I talked about, this idea of the hero's journey. I call that the myth of the single choice. Like one big choice stands between me and success. You know, and I'm like, <laughs> mm, I don't know. I'm sure you guys know a lot from your real estate theory that real estate's about building portfolios, right? It's yes, about taking yes. multiple risks. It's not about the single like, home run or grand slam. Yes, you might choose to take one bigger risk in your life. My mm-hmm. my father is an example as a doctor. He bought a building, you know, in order to start a walk-in clinic. But like that was a big risk where his little risk was like maybe renting it out to, you know, five other doctors. Like uh, real estate goes by the same principle. You have to think in terms of portfolios and taking multiple yes. parallel risks, not a single choice on which you put everything. I, I love that you're saying this. Uh, yeah, I teach this concept a lot on these. I do these live webinars every week and I teach people kind of how to get started. And I always say that wealth is not built through a property. It's built through a portfolio. In other words, like people are like freaking out about that first deal. They got, it's got to be a home run. It's got to be the best deal yes. ever. Like the kind that we brag about on the show occasionally. Like, oh, I just bought this amazing, like, the most important thing that you can do, and I, I think I'm going to start rephrasing it the way that you call it, the wrist muscle. The most important thing you can do is get started because, like, yeah. even with a mediocre deal, even with a break-even deal, because, like, it builds that wrist muscle. It builds that, like, momentum, it. right? Like, it builds momentum. Yeah. It builds learning. You have a feedback yeah. loop, right? You yep. can plan for your next deal better. Like, all this abstract planning from afar and then never taking a single risk It's like, it's crazy to me, but I think that people don't think about risk as portfolios. And it's weird because financial trading teaches us to do that. You know, real estate investing teaches us to do that. By the way, even tech companies take multiple risks, right? Like they take risks and upon risk upon risk, many little in order to pivot. So by the time they've pivoted, you know, 180 degrees, it's actually the result of probably 50 different choices, not a single Mm. large, gigantic step into the unknown. Yet when it comes to our careers and ourselves, we really don't embrace calculated risk taking. And I think that's the opportunity. What do you think about this concept that, at least from my perspective, when you first start a new endeavor, you're first working a new muscle, you're learning to ride a bike, you're learning to snowboard, you got a new job. The risk is always highest in the beginning, right? Mm -hmm. For a startup company, the risk is always biggest in the front part of that journey. And then as you figure it out, the risk starts to decrease. Mm -hmm. So many people try something once or twice, they fall off the bike and they go, oh, this wasn't for me. Do Do you see that happen a lot too? I do. And the irony is, so I think most people presume, so I think there are two things. Psychologically, the first risk is the hardest. Does that make sense? Psychologically. Yes. Because yeah. by the time you've made one choice and see how it works out, the next choice is easier and the choice after that. Because you you know that at a minimum, you know how to respond, right? You learn how to respond. So like the first, cho- psychologically, the first choice is the scariest. Ironically, the best way to get into action is to think about the smallest micro risks you can take. Because I think the minute you make it a big one, it's kind of a doozy and you might never get started. Mm -hmm. And that's why it's so scary because we put everything on the first choice. And ironically, I feel like all the power is in continuing to choose. I always say to people like, I'd rather choose imperfectly 15 times to get to an outcome than choose once perfectly. I don't know. What do you want to do? But everybody's so busy thinking that they have to choose once perfectly. And to your point, so I think psychologically, it's it's the hardest for to take the first risk. Ironically, you could start with the smallest smidgen of a movement and get into motion. What's an ex- what's an example of that? Like a, a smaller kind of micro choice? Sure, like anything. Like we were chatting about. Let's say let's say you think you want to you know um, 
go join a startup and you just don't know what it's like. The micro choices, you don't have to take the first recruiter call that comes your way. The micro choices, you could go do five informational interviews with like five people who are in startups. The micro choices, you could go figure out if there's a new emerging division at your company. The micro choices, you could start a side hustle. The micro choices, you could go take, you know, classes or join an incubator and pair up with somebody at night. Like those are all micro choices before you have to actually quit your job and take the first thing that comes your way, you know? So I always think that micro choices are the smallest choice you can make that gets you information um, and learning and some sense of what it will be like. Is that the same thing as uh, you mentioned earlier, the minimal, minimal viable choice? Is that what that is? The MVC. Yeah. I would say that I would, I would say when we're contemplating bigger choices, I have this like thesis in my head, which I'm happy to share if it's useful of like the things you should be evaluating on bigger choices. But I always say at the end, like, suppose you've evaluated, you know, some bigger leap you're thinking about making a job change, whatever, and you've gotten it all down on paper. You've done the pros and the cons. You've talked to your like, your, you know, your personal kitchen cabinet, all that stuff, you still can't choose. What I would say is like, make the minimum viable choice. What's the smallest piece of the choice you can make to get into motion? Because Mm -hmm. that's all that matters. Like, you know, that's all that matters. Whether you make the choice in one big swoop or whether you make like 10, you know, a hundred little choices to get you along the way, the MVC, I'm just like, just pick the MVC. What's the MVC? (laughs) So you did something after you did all that evaluation. You know, if you can't bear to do the the big choice, do the small choice. Any choice is a yeah. good choice to get you st- I, I, started. I like that a lot. When I think of like putting this in the, an example of like getting started with a real estate investment portfolio, for example, like you, you don't have to commit to buying a property and committing hundreds of thousands of dollars right away, right? Like that's the mm-hmm. scary, that's the big picture, right? Yeah. The beginning is like you could spend an afternoon going to an open house. Like that's a you super low, easy like thing that's to do. You an could NPC. go and analyze... Yeah, that's it. Just go to an open house. Go talk with one real estate agent. Costs no money whatsoever. Yep. Gets you out of that comfort zone. Like analyze some properties. Like run the numbers. Yeah, just see what amazing. you think. Right. Yeah. And don't you find it interesting? And I know we keep harping on this, so I'm happy to move on. I always feel like people look at big binary choices and then they're frozen mm-hmm. and afraid to move. And I'm like, yes. well, if you're afraid to make the big binary choice, make the smallest commitment you can and like get yep. information, you know, get going, discover, pipeline, you know, learn. Yeah. These are all great ways to spend your time. And I always am like, if you can't, commit risk a little bit of time what makes you think you can risk your whole career <laughs> like, if you can't risk a little bit of time to go to an open house what yeah exactly think, <laughs> what makes you think it's the right thing to like buy building yet uh exactly i use the analogy often of like if you, like i used to live in the pacific northwest and you know you're yeah. silicon valley you, you're familiar with this as well it's just foggy sometimes right so you're driving in the early morning it's foggy you can't see two miles down the road and so like this fear builds up like oh what if there's a an accident what if there's a deer in the road what if there's a, an animal what if i can't like right but it would be ridiculous to pull over to the side of the road just because you can't see two miles down the road so instead what do we do we just drive a little slower right take, take it easy go like ease off the I ass totally turn your high agree. beams off yeah it's, What's so funny, I, I heard an analogy once from somebody in Silicon Valley um, that I quote in the book because I love it. It's like, you know, making a move is like being on the monkey bars. We always think we need to see to the end of the yeah, course, yeah. but you don't, right? You just need to reach for the next rung. And if you reach Ooh, for the next analogy. rung, right? Like that. Yeah, it's a good one, right? I, like, I like the monkey bars analogy. I can't yeah, take credit good. for it, but I like it. <laughs> I really like that a lot. Yeah, and so much it's so much easier than you like, you take a lot of pressure off yourself. Mm-hmm. I mean, like, you don't have to think, how am I going to, how am I going to make $10,000 a month for my, for my business so I can quit my job? Like that's a scary, big picture thing. So stop worrying about it. Absolutely. And look, I mean, all of these strategies are just to get you in motion, right? I yeah. think it's also interesting for us to talk about, if you want, how do you get smarter about the risks you take? Like, you know, first and foremost, you get to get in motion. And a lot of that is like debunking this idea that there's a single choice. If you, the minute you know, you can keep choosing, like the minute you know that, right, it takes the pressure off the first choice. It makes it easier to make the first choice because you're like, wait, after yeah. the first choice, there's a second and a third and a fourth and a fifth mm. and a tenth. Like it's not done in one. Um, but I think the second thing that people often kind of, you think about other myth, myths about risk taking, the other myths are really about like, like how do you become a calculated risk taker and how do you get smart about the risks you take? And I think that's also another place where people are like a hope and a prayer. They send, to, They tend to sort of 
overweight that everything is their own execution. Like I need to be a perfect executor. This is why you see these. You know, I've been a CEO yeah. before. So I see all these perfect plans. Like you try and plan for a quarter. Every team brings you the perfect plan, all the things mm -hmm. that will go right. And I'm like, okay, that's interesting. But like maybe the more strategic, you know, risk-taking approach is to plan for what can go wrong. And David, you talked about this earlier. Like, you know, this links very much to fears of failure. Like it's not just like helping people see that they can take little risks. I think often being a smart risk-taker is helping people conquer their fear of failure. And think about, you know, all of the choices they might make if something goes wrong and maybe even plan asymmetrically for the downside. Like if you actually planned more for the things that could go wrong than could go right, you're likely to weirdly conquer your fear of failure and be able to go pursue a choice rather than, you know, just hoping everything's going to go right, visualizing only success. Um, mm -hmm. So I think there are these, these tact other tactics that can help people get smarter about the risks they're going to take and actually get them in emotion too. I love what you're saying because you're, you're highlighting how emotional this decision really is. But we yes. tend to operate in our neocortex where we think it's all just whatever is on paper. But mm -hmm. like the concept of momentum is it's all in your head. The, mm -hmm. you, what's a good way to describe it? When you consider going to like a, a workout class and you mm -hmm. see CrossFit people, mm -hmm. and you're like, I could never do what they're doing. Working out is not for me. Mm -hmm. Well, the reality is they all felt that way first. Maybe where you need to start off is, is just going for a swim in the morning or going for a walk. And then mm -hmm. that wasn't so bad. And then you take a light jog and you're like, actually, I kind of liked how I felt. I want to take another one. And, and like those progressive steps get you to the point where I'm going to go to CrossFit, but I'm going to have very low expectations. I don't care if I just work out with the bar, not even a weight on it. I just want to get through a workout. That's my goal. And then you get through it and you go, okay, that was a bigger deal than I thought. Next time I'm going to push it a little bit harder. So much of business works just like that. I would bet you, Sukinder, if, if we went back in your life 10, 15 years and they said, here's where you're going to end up, you would have had zero idea that this is where you would have ended up just doing your best every day and going to work. And maybe you would have even said, yeah, I don't want that. That's not who the version of me right now would, would want to be doing. It's almost good sometimes, I guess, that we don't see what's at the end of the monkey bars um, because the person that we're going to be when we get to the end isn't the person we are right now. And so we can't know how it's going to feel when we get there. Yeah, I, I think that's true. By the way, I mean, make no mistake, I always have a plan. So, you know, I call it my whiteboard plan, which is I kind of roughly knew I always wanted to be a CEO, right? And I roughly knew I'd want to do sort of be a CEO of a consumer company, but I didn't know how, to your point, precisely, mm -hmm. right? And getting into motion gave me the confidence that, you know, A, I could make things happen and B, I could respond to the things happening around me, which is as important when you're a risk taker, right? It's like technology. You don't always have control of the situation. So you don't know quite how you're going to get there because unfortunately, 100% of, you know, our success is not just about our execution. It's about the macro environment we're in, the headwinds, the tailwinds in the world of real estate. It's like, you know, what are the macro conditions? What yeah. regions are booming and what regions are flailing. Like there's a bunch going on around you that you have to respond to. But I think to your point, once you learn that you can respond, you know, and be agile, you sort of gain confidence that you'll figure it out and you'll hit that macro goal. You just don't know precisely how, right? But you're more comfortable with things unfolding as opposed to saying, if it doesn't unfold the exact way I predicted, I'm screwed. Um, so you're right. I, you know, I always had an intention to be a CEO and I became one. I just couldn't have told you how. And, mm -hmm. and the irony is 20 years later, I say to people like my career looks pretty cyclical. People think of it as linear because they only want to manage that. Like they only see the peaks of my career. They're like, Oh, so kinder, you did this. And then you did this and then you did this. I'm like, yeah, but if I showed you the cycles underneath that, you'd see a different kind of repeating pattern, which is, mm -hmm. you know, the rewards that I imagined were to your point, they weren't, they didn't unfold exactly as I imagined. Sometimes I ended up in the, with an entirely different reward in an entirely different place for a risk I took. But over the course of time, if you just repeat the cycles, yes, I have had compounding benefit and I roughly got where I wanted to go, just not exactly the way I imagined. Um, so it's about playing out the cycles. Yeah. So what about um, somebody who wants to get into, say, my analogy of the CrossFit gym, but they don't see anyone there that looks like them, that comes from their background. They don't have a way to connect with any of the people that are like, these are a bunch of grunting, sweating people, and they don't have a background in that type of thing. But they still know this is important. Do you have any advice for both what the gym can do to make that a more appealing environment to different people as well as what people can do to get themselves kind of acclimated? Yeah, well, you're hitting on, I think, a topic that's near and dear to my heart, which is 
is it safe for everyone to take risk? And for those of us who have to create environments in which people take risk, what do you do? And then to your point, like what's the accountability on the person involved, right? And so let's start with the easier side of that, which we've just been chatting about. If you're the person involved, I always say like one of the ways to be a smart risk taker is to put yourself in environments where um, you find people who share your values because that's one of the things that makes it easier to take risk, right? Like we all, I think you know this, the research all suggests that we'll all do better if we're in environments with diverse thinking. That's great. But you know what's underneath diverse thinking is shared values, right? We Like you can only really put yourself at risk when you trust that the people around you, you know, are similarly, um, I don't want to say similarly minded because that sort of like that means homogeneous thinking. I just mean like have similar values, you know, that at the end of the day, their sense of and worldview is similar. Like I, as we talk about values is what, what you think is just and fair. So when you're in environments where you, you know, you can find people with common values, you can do your best work to your point. You can take more risks. You can say something in a meeting and not worry that, you know, you're going to get shamed, right? Like you can do all the things that are not, you can go to that CrossFit gym, right? And if that CrossFit gym, you know, this is the word of the day, you guys know this, like, feels inclusive, meaning it feels like you have a tribe of people who you can imagine share your values. That could be because, you know, the person at the front, you know, at the front door of the gym, at the countertop, even if they look beautiful, like, you know, is welcoming and friendly and shares a story about something from their personal life that makes you feel like they're not perfect. And then you're like, oh, I can enter this gym. I don't quite feel like an ass, (laughs) right? And I can go try it out to make the analogy sound. So I think that our job is to Look for environments where we find people who, who we think we have values fit. And then to your point, it's to take those little risks. It's to, you know, manage your own fear of failure by like thinking about what's the worst thing that could happen if I act. I always say that like that. So that's in our realm of what's possible. I think if you're a leader who's managing environments, you know, and you're thinking about how to make it safe for everyone to take risk. I think, A, there has to be equal access to opportunity. Like, you know, you think about a company where you're like, well, I want somebody to take a risk. Well, what they need to see is that everywhere around them, they see demonstration that like people who look differently can succeed, that there are multiple paths to the top. Does that make sense? If everybody looks the same and everybody who's successful looks the same and, you know, the the CEO or the leader in question like treats only certain people well and not others, or, you know, always uses one person to demonstrate the exercise who's like, absolutely, you know, impeccable. Like these are all things that, you know, may make people feel like it's not possible for them. And we have to realize when people perceive that it's not possible for them, they may take less risk, even though we want them to take more. So I think as leaders, our opportunities, whenever environments we create, we have to expand access to what's possible and show multiple types of success, you know, celebrate multiple types of risk taking, celebrate different types of risk takers. When the introverted person in the room speaks, like celebrate it. You know, when somebody who never says something um, in a room, you know, says something smart, say, oh, like reinforce it five times over and be like, oh, like Brendan said in that other meeting, if they give credit, like these are all things you can do to make it possible for people to feel like they can take risk in environments you create. Well, let's talk about one specific uh, group that applies to us as real estate investors. I'm curious your thoughts on it. And that is women real estate investors. I mean, 80% probably give or take of our listeners are male and it's a very male dominated industry. Is that Mm -hmm. like, I don't want to, sweep, you know, broad generalizations, but is that because women tend to be less risk takers and that's why they don't necessarily come into real estate as a field more? Or are there things that we can do to try to foster more, uh, more women in this industry? Yeah, I think, well, I, I think that there are a couple of things to unpack there. First of all, there is a lot of third party research. Like, remember, I am not a statistician. I'm, a, sure, know, yeah. I'm an operator who wrote a book, but I, you know, there is a lot of research that talks about the fact that men and women do perceive risk differently. By the way, that doesn't mean that women lack ambition. It just means they have different yeah. perceptions of risk-taking. I will say we put out a very simple quiz with like four different risk archetypes on the book site. You know, it's at choosepossibility.com. You can take a risk quiz that's sort of, you know, less than 60 seconds to take. But interestingly, when we put um, our risk quiz out to a sample of the U.S. population, we also found differences between how men and women generally perceive uh, or categorize themselves as risk takers. And, you know, we have four risk taking types on the site. One is called a uh, uh, calculator. You can probably imagine what that is. Pros, cons, but can make decisions. The contemplator, which is the most popular style in the United States. 60% of the people we surveyed are contemplators, which means pros, cons, but can sometimes be stuck in indecision and have regrets yeah. for choices they didn't make. Then on either side of that, to the, to the, you know, to the extreme of the calculator is the change seeker. Somebody who's like, 
moving all the time, almost like so often you're like, wait, can you just sit still for a moment? They can, they have more of a threat of acting rashly, but they probably never miss an opportunity, right? They also might be the overcommitter. And then on the other side, uh, the extreme opposite of the change seeker is what we call the critic, who more naturally sees the danger in any situation. It's far easier for them to identify the danger than the upside of a situation. So when we put that survey out, women and men generally index similarly, but women were more likely to be contemplators and more likely to be critics. So I do think there are differences in how people take risk. And so could that explain why women are less entrepreneurial in some fields, including real estate? Potentially, right? But it also, to your point, invokes, well, what do you need to do to make it, you know, make it comfortable for different types of people to take risk? And, you know, I don't know. And I know it's hard to be the poster child in any in any situation when you're the one. But the reality is when you have successful female real estate investors, what can you do to signal that you are yeah. open to attracting more? How do you highlight and celebrate those successes? You know, how do you acknowledge what those folks needed to do differently? Um, so I think that I think that there are some explanations for why different fields, including real estate, you know, have different profiles on men and women. And, and I think risk-taking is certainly plays into it. But the other thing that plays into it is, you know, how do we make it possible for all people in any given field to participate? Um, and I, I don't know, you guys tell me, I would think that in some ways real estate is actually good for women and that it has some flexibility and we're setting your own hours if you want to be, let's, let's call it a, you know, a caregiver. But on the other hand, it's 100% commission-based often, right? Like you eat what you kill yeah. if you're an agent. I, I could be wrong, but you yeah. guys know better. Yeah. And I think if you're a real it estate is. investor, you have to take some portion of your savings, right, and put it in an asset that might be locked up for a period of time. So these are all things that might give, you know, people who are more contemplators pause, <laughs> right? And so yeah. maybe what you need to do is even identify how, you know, how different people can be successful and what micro success, micro choices are available. like. Is there a way for someone to get started in, you know, investing in real estate through a fund or through a group of angels? Like, you know, these are all ways you can sort of demonstrate that it's possible to get started in smaller, in smaller waves. I have a, I have a real estate fund that, you know, we raised, I don't know, $75 million or something like that in the Congrats. last year to buy a bunch of yep. things. Yeah, it's cool. But oh, I would say, I don't know if I'd say majority, but I'd say it's probably pretty close to majority of people have said the reason they're investing with us is because... They want to eventually do it on their own, but this is a low risk way to get in, to, get to in, feel like right? they're t- to take them. So I, I just kind of connected that full circle yes. to what we talked about earlier is it's a good way to like, and a lot of our investors are women. A lot of them are women uh, yeah. or like led, you know, they're married couples, but the woman's the one that we, we talk well, with yes, and they reach out and we have a conversation with. Yeah, they're decision. leading that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But, but, you know, maybe what, you know, and again, I'm not here to theorize on your business, but, yeah. you know, I think what you can do to invite in, you know, groups that are underrepresented and to make room for them, I will yeah. just acknowledge that sometimes that takes additional effort, right? Like yeah. it's the same thing with like boards. You guys know that I have a platform called the yep. board list that tries to uh, create representation in the boardroom. And there's no doubt, like I hear from many people, like, you know, I go after women and they say no at a disproportionate rate. They literally say yeah. no. At a, I, I get all the way to the offer and they say no. I said, yeah, yep. I understand that. So all I can tell you yeah. is you unfortunately have to go at, go at it, you know, multiple more times. Like you might have to fill your pipeline 80% with women to get a 50%, you know, take rate from women because they may say no yeah. at a disproportionate rate. Anyway, it's uh, it's not a single fasted problem. Yeah, we get that same issue like on the podcast itself. You know, like yeah. we, we try to get as many women as we can, but I would say we get rejected nine times out of 10 if I ask a woman to be on the show. My own oh, wife no. has not been on the show. She, she won't do it. She's, a, she's too, like, she wants to be behind the scenes where I, I tend to like put this on like most guys like myself. Like, I mean, guys that I know, we like to be out in front and center. I don't know. I like being <laughs> the guy in the podcast. And so it's just a, it's a, it's a difference, but it goes to like, it doesn't mean I just should accept the fact, oh, well, well, you know, most of the people applying are men. It's like, well, how do we encourage more women too? how do we make them feel more comfortable to, uh, to apply? How do we, how do we reach women where they're at? And I found this with people of color as well. I mean, most people that apply for my job positions they're they look and sound just like me. Mm-hmm. And so the question I, I had a good buddy the other day called me out and he said, well, what are you doing what are you doing to reach out to other groups of people that aren't looking and sounding like you? Cause those people are already, they're already in your world. So how are yeah. you going into another world to attract uh, more people and more applicants and more people? And I was like, I'm not really, I'm just relying on my own audience, which is just like the self-fulfilling kind of 
you know, cycle. Prophecy. We all live in that. Yeah, we, you absolutely do. If you want to extend possibility, you have to expand possibility, right? You have to just, mm. and that, and I understand that that takes work. Um, it does, also yeah. has great but, rewards, you know, and in, in terms yeah. of better performance, right? We know that, but, uh, but I yeah. totally get it. And so, yeah, maybe coming all the way back, I think uh, one of the fun things for your audience to do, whether you're a man or a woman, person of color, or, you know, of, you know, of kind of the majority origin, it doesn't matter, but, you know, go take the risk quiz and learn a little bit about your own yeah. style. Because I think I will say that like, you don't need to sit. I always think that people think they need to be this ultimate optimist to be risky or to be risk takers or risky to naturally risky to be risk takers. And I'm like, nothing could be further from the truth. You just know what need to know what you are and deliberately make choices, right. That put you on the path to building the muscle. And, you know, and then I think optimism is the output, to be honest, being becoming a risk taker is an output of the practice, not an input. Oh, that's really good. I like that. Well, before we let you go, I do want a couple, a couple more things. It would be, it would be sad not to pick the brain of somebody who's been in Silicon Valley and helped numerous companies grow and, and succeed and sell and all these cool things. So I just got a, a few questions I want to just throw at you related to just sure. growth in general. Uh, sure. First one, uh, you know, looking at teams and mm-hmm. specifically like leaders of teams, like whether it's the, the, you know, not necessarily like the board of directors teams, but yeah, like the, yeah. the, the senior leadership team of companies. What have you found has been like, a reoccurring trait or what have you seen that just works? You're like, yes, this works, whether the team's 50 people, five people, hundred people, like this trait or these traits seem to really work in terms of helping a company grow and stay successful. Sure. Um, so one of my favorite traits and I look for it in people, I, I try and practice it myself, uh, albeit imperfectly is what I call the, you manage me or I manage you principle, which would you prefer? People are like, what, what do you mean? And I think that most leaders think that the job of a leader is to manage down to others. If I said to you like, oh, you're a new manager, what do you do? Do you manage others or do you let others manage you? The typical response is, oh, I manage others. And I'm like, really? Is that the path to fastest leverage and scaling for yourself and that person? And if you just step back and reverse it for a moment, think about what happens, right? So I'm a leader. I, I don't know about you guys, but you know what I really love? I love highly leveraged interactions where I meet up with somebody. We talk about a topic. It's pretty efficient, time efficient. Yep. It's pretty effective. We both learn something and we move on, right? By the way, I'm plenty opinionated, as you can tell. So in the absence of somebody coming into my room with an opinion, they will leave with my opinion. I will say to people, if you walk in with no <laughs> opinion, you will leave with my opinion because I can't help but be opinionated. But I'm like, but if you want the higher leverage interaction where we both scale and we both get joy, it looks something like you walk into a room expecting to manage me. I'm your boss, but you walk in with an agenda. You walk in with your own vision. You walk in with three potential solutions. Mm -hmm. You walk in with a couple of things you want feedback on. You take control of that dynamic the minute you do that, right? And we have a conversation on your terms, not on my terms. And by the way, if you think that's not fun for me, it's super fun for me because I'm like, oh, great. I just met this person. They're super capable. Oh my God, look at all the stuff they're doing. Oh, like, and I got my dose because I got to throw in my three ideas because I always have three ideas. And, you know, that was really fun and interesting and leveraged. And now I get to turn around and go do that again with somebody else. And I have a really fun day when I do those things. Nothing drains me more than feeling like I have to manage down to people and tell them what to do. Yeah. I can also tell you nothing drains people more than feeling like they are micromanaged by others. And so the way to reverse that dynamic, you tell people actively like, yeah, your job is to manage me. We both scale, right? You get your vision. I get my vision. I get my insight and we both get more leverage. So I think that one of the traits I really like in others and I seek out and I seek to be as I, you know, I seek to find Uh, people who want to manage up. I feel like they, you know, learn pretty quickly how to identify their vision and share it and put problems on the table. And I like leaders who don't hang on to control and management because they think it's a sign of them, of their perfection. I'm like, look, you're, you know, you scale when the teams around you scale, when people become great around you, you are seen as a great leader. So let go of this idea that, you know, greatness is in manage micromanaging everyone else. Greatness is in letting people, you know, show up and drive in a structured way and being able to complement and give them leverage to their efforts. I really, really like that. Uh, I really, I heard once Gary Vaynerchuk, you know, speaker, Mm -hmm. Gary Vaynerchuk, he, I don't even know what to call Gary, but Gary once said that, uh, somebody said, Hey, explain, they said like, what's your best, uh, tip for managing people? Mm -hmm. And he said, I work for them. And I remember just hearing that he said that and I was like, that's such a great, like, tip. And it's like, I, I work for like, they're the ones running this company. Like I work for them. If they need me for something, I'll, I'll I'm going to do what they need me to do. And I can offer my opinion, but I work for them. And it's kind of the same concept that I think 
Yeah, because nobody wants to be managed and I don't want to manage people. I don't want to tell them this is your next step and this is the one after that. I want you to, but how do you find those people? That's something that a lot of us struggle with is how do you find people that want to operate that way that aren't just waiting to be told what to do? Yeah, you know, it's a good question because I think that part of it might be the construct we create. Like, you know, at some point in all of my leadership teams, I've been like, guys, I only have one ask. Please create a freaking ad- agenda on Google Doc and start every one of our meetings with an agenda and give me like 3,000 feet, 300 feet, and 30,000 feet. Like, what are your issues? You know, and like, so sometimes you can just create a construct in which people feel yeah. like, you know, support and a framework in which to operate that way. I think that's a big part of it, right? Um, and certainly, look, I don't know about you. And like, what do I look for natively in people? I look for, <laughs> this comes, this brings us full circle. I look for people who have shown flexibility and a capacity to operate in different environments and still find success. And by, by the way, I don't yeah. mean success as in never failed. Like to me, success might be, I went to a startup, you know, I started a company, it didn't work out, but here are the five things I learned, you know, and the skills I achieved. That to me is success as much as the person who comes in and has only ever had the perfect resume. So I look for people who are pretty agile in their background as demonstrated by they were successful. They managed to have impact in different environments. And when I can see that somebody can have impact in different environments, I have a pretty good sense that maybe they can come in and they would find this type of management style freeing. There are other people, by the way, for whom it's frightening. I have certainly also worked with people who want to be coached. Like, and, and I certainly, you know, there are people whose leadership styles co- in coaching is much better than mine. I would not call myself a very effective, like step-by-step coach. There are people who really love that style of management, but to your point, like given my style, I definitely am looking for people who, you know, want to scale and grow and, and, and are not completely frightened by white space while giving them some construct in which to grow. I really like that you're, it makes me think of like times where I, I'll give you an example. I'm managing contractors on a project, let's say, right? Mm-hmm. So I have a, I have a flip going or I have a rehab going. I actually have one right now. It's a condo out here in Maui. And it, I have created a situation in, and I've created a relationship with my contractor when I, that, that I say, paint this, caulk this line, tear mm-hmm. out this flooring here. And then he does it. And then it's like, okay, now do this, now do this, now do this. And he'll do, he'll do exactly that because that's the relationship that I, as the leader, as the one with the, mm-hmm. with the checkbook have then mm-hmm. created. And then, and so then I get frustrated. I'm like, why am I managing this? Like, why don't we just do his own thing? It's, <laughs> it's my own fault, right? Like I created that expectation <laughs> versus this is the vision where I want to see. And yeah. then let, I want you, I trust you as my contract. Like it's had I phrased the entire thing differently. And I, and at any point we can stop and readjust too. I can have a conversation with the contract. Like, Hey, I was leading this wrong. I want to readjust. I want to trust you. Let's set up a new framework for how we're going to operate. And this is the vision. And, and I can change that. I love anyway, it. Just, you can change yeah, it. Just it just occurred to me why clear, I'm struggling like, with think- this. <laughs> but I think your contractor does need a framework. Like I think that some people, yes. you know, some people can operate without any framework and they create the framework. What I've found though often is when you give people a blank slate, it's also frightening. So you sort of have to say, yeah. hey, here's the framework. So in my case, it might be like, hey, can you come with a weekly agenda? Just put your thoughts down in this order. So like I can see how you're thinking about things. But I know if I didn't give them a construct, it would just be like, what, what, what do you want from me? Yeah. Cause people are always yep. worried about disappointing other people's expectations. Does that make sense? So I think if you create a shared construct or worldview and he's telling you say, Hey, what do you want? You want to put your next five steps on a Google sheet? Like what's it like, you know? So I, I, I think yeah. uh, <laughs> let's put it this way. I've always been somebody who gave people a lot of rope and sometimes they're like, Sukinder, you give people too much rope. And then when they're drowning, then you like yank it all the way back in. So I'm making fun of myself. So I'm trying to give you better yep. advice than that, which is really, you know, I've learned to my own chagrin that you can't just give people like complete white space either if it's frightening and daunting and then they do nothing. It's about that framework. Just yeah. like the book is a framework. People like frameworks, right? They like, they like a known them. canvas in which to paint, but you have to trust that they yes. can paint. You just have to give them a canvas, you know, and say, this is the way the canvas operates. This is its size. This is its dimensions. And like, I can't tell exactly what masterpiece you're going to create, but I can say, if you use the canvas, you'll find success. This is what I like so much about my, my company uses a system called EOS, the entrepreneur operating system. It's from the book yeah. Traction, which I think I have yeah, sitting here on my yeah. desk. Yeah. And like, like Traction is just one example or EOS is one example of a framework 
that we then adopted. Now I could have chosen another framework. There's lots of management frameworks out there. I just chose that one. Yeah. And then it's like, we meet once a week. This is what the conversation is. And as soon as I did that, it dropped my workload down to like, I don't know, a quarter yeah. of what I was working before. And everything just went through the roof. I mean, just exploded uh, in my company in a good way. And I don't have to manage people anymore because the framework manages people. But it wasn't just a go buy real estate, guys. Have fun. I'm over here on the couch watching TV. Right. Like that would just create a mess. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Exactly. There's that middle. Yeah. There's a map. There's a method. Um, Right. So you want to agree on the method and, and, you know, a method that allows people to feel like they're getting leverage too, not just like. Yeah pulling on you. It's draining both ways the other way. So anyway, you asked, I think like 10 minutes ago, what my principle was. That's one of the big ones. Okay. I like that a lot. Uh, what, what about hiring? We mentioned hiring a little bit and finding people, but in this world where like tech companies are paying, you know, $200,000 a year and they're giving free lunches and they're giving, you know, three day, you know, unlimited vacation. Like how do we compete? Like the people we're hiring, is that what they expect? The, the candy wall at the, (laughs) at the office and they need the ping pong table. Like what is it yeah. they're looking for? Well, I think I think people are looking for three things as we chatted about. And one is hard benefits, like like literally cash comp. I mean, people sure. have to like make a living, you know, so pro- provide for their families. So of course that matters. And you know, it's very hard to compete with the big companies. For me, like I didn't run like Google, but of course I worked at Google and then I ran StubHub and had to compete against Google for talent. So I totally yeah. get it, yeah. right? So one is meant, is that. But number two is soft benefits. And this is one of the places where I feel like small businesses can compete, right? Because whether or not the small the benefit now is remote work, whether the benefit is bring your dogs to work, whether the benefit is like, mm-hmm. hey, guess what? If you have a daycare, you know, we're going to contribute, I don't know, 10% of the cost. Whether it's, you know, if you have a sick parent, you can, you, you can go wherever you need to be. I I feel like flexibility in how we work is one of the things small businesses um, really offer. And also, by the way, generally less FaceTime. You know, generally everyone is so productive in a small business. FaceTime is often like yeah. when you get big and bureaucratic and you want to make sure yep. people are actually getting done. So when your company's smaller, like, you know, you, you have the benefit of actually knowing everybody and what they're doing. So I think the soft benefits is a place to compete. And the last one is what I talked about. My feeling is we're living in an era where not just millennials, but even older folks really care about the values of the place they work. What do you stand for yes. as a leader? And I will say to people, whatever it is, whatever your value system is, making that transparent is what people expect. Do you know what I mean? They come to work now, not just wanting the hard benefits and the soft benefits. They will come to work wanting to feel like they have a tribe of people with whom they share, you know, a view of what's important and what's right. And I think we can all agree that that's been, you know, something that's become even more apparent over the last five years, not just for millennials, but quite frankly, or Gen Z, but for all of us. And so that's another place to compete. What do you stand for? Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. One thing I've said in my business now, not all companies can say this, but I, but like in real estate, we kind of can, is that like, if you work for me, like I, my, my hope is that this is the last job you ever have to have. Mm -hmm. Like maybe you'll have other job, but like, that's kind of that third thing. Like I want you to come on, not just as an employee, but I want you to like, look, like change your very mindset. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. It's that, it's that model. Yeah. I think the model of apprenticeship is really powerful um, because people get to be very proximate, right? That's something you don't get in a big company. Again, you get it in a smaller company. Um, So you know, I think there's, and, and by the way, oh, there's one more, right? Job, job, like moving laterally, trying different roles and jobs, like having two roles at once. Like these are all the types of things where people know they're going to learn faster working with you. And I think it's hard to underestimate those benefits. Yeah, really good. Really good stuff. All right. Well, David, I've been hogging the thing. Any questions you want to ask of a Silicon Valley powerhouse here before we move on to the famous four? So Kinder starting from the bottom, working your way up to CEO, sitting on multiple boards, you you really have a vast array of experience in seeing what works and what doesn't work in different places. Is there a key piece of advice, maybe like a fundamental understanding or a skill set that you tell people, hey, if you want to be successful overall, this is what I would have you focus on? Sure. I would say uh, I have one phrase that I believe, and I don't think it's I think it's very complimentary to this point of view of how you become a risk taker, which is do great work for great people. It doesn't even matter what, like people think it matters what, and I'm like, no, no, it matters who do great work. So yes, hustle, flex, adapt, you know, soak it all in apprentice for great people and great people doesn't mean the nicest people. It doesn't mean like, it means people who share your values and can teach you something and who you admire for their Mm. capabilities. Right. So shared values, really like people you'd be lucky to be in a room to learn from 
and just like hustle for those people. Like 99.9% of my success is doing great work for great people. And like it kind of then didn't matter what the industry was or what happened. I found joy in my job and they saw the best of me. We got to slowly start working towards the end. So we're going to move to our last segment of the show. And that is called our Famous Four. This is the part of the show where we ask the same four questions every week to every guest. We're going to throw them at you right now. So the first question is, is there a habit or trait you are currently working on improving in your own life? Not letting people finish speaking. I'm always thinking so fast <laughs> that I finish people's sentences. It's my ongoing same. work. I can't stop I'm my brain. I'm glad it's not just me. Okay, next question. Do you have a favorite business book? It used to be good to great, but now I'm going to give you my second one, which is Growth Beyond the Hockey Stick from McKinsey, which analyzes, you know, strategy beyond the hockey stick. So I always say Growth Beyond the Hockey Stick. It's all actually called Strategy Beyond the Hockey Stick by McKinsey, which analyzes why, you know, a set of companies over 30 years become outsized performers. So mm. I like that plus good to great. Good to great is an old classic. Strategy Beyond the Hockey Stick is like an even more recent framework. And the hockey stick is the understanding of like linear or a, a geometric progression of your slowly learning and then boom, you hit an inflection point and you success got it. takes off, yeah. right? Growth okay. beyond the hockey stick, like how companies really like succeed over a long period of time. Beautiful. Okay. What about some of your hobbies? Uh, tennis these days though, I just hurt my hand. Tennis, skiing, fashion, decor, my kids. Mm. Those are the five. You rip those off very fast. Have you answered that question before? Yeah. Tennis, skiing, fashion, decor. <laughs> and my kids. And my kids. Yeah. They're still a hobby. They may not want to be a hobby any longer, but they're still my hobby. All right. Then my uh, final question. What do you believe sets apart successful entrepreneurs from those who give up, fail, or never get started? It's kind of what you answered a minute ago, but maybe you got another uh, piece of advice in there. Yeah. My other piece of advice is that entrepreneurs who, uh, who win consistently choose possibility. They underweight a single choice and move in favor of knowing they have multiple choices to make between now and success. And they just keep iterating. Okay, that's awesome. Last question of the day. Where can people find out more about you? Uh, you can always find me on LinkedIn, just at, at my handle, Sue Kendra St. Cassidy. Or you can uh, find out more about the book at the book website, www.choosepossibility.com. All right. Thank you, Sukinder. I really appreciate you sharing your wisdom, your experience, your encouraging words. Everybody, please go check out the book. If it's half as good as this interview, I know that you will love it. Thanks again for coming on. Any parting words before we get out of here? No, I loved it. You guys did an awesome job. Thank you for having me. All right. Awesome. Thank you very much. This is David Green for Brandon, the $75 million man Turner, signing off. You're listening to Bigger Pockets Radio, simplifying real estate for investors large and small. If you're here looking to learn about real estate investing without all the hype, you're in the right place. Stay tuned and be sure to join the millions of others who have benefited from BiggerPockets.com, your home for real estate investing online.